um, Hernan said something rather important during the break, which sort of leads to the next, next thing. He said, but you should even ask these guys whether they want to be considered programmers. Am I quoting you correctly? And most of them would say, oh, I'm an architect. <laughs> or I'm an architect, uh, which is sort of, I don't know what it means. I remember this is sort of unrelated story, but let me tell you that I think it's very funny. Uh, some point during my uh, management executive days, uh, I had got a job at AT&T, and my title was the chief internet architect, VP and chief, inter chief internet architect. Uh, but as a part of hiring process, they sent me to get a medical exam. Because since I was an important executive, they wanted me to live. So I went to, to take this medical test and talked to the doctor. And he looks at me and said, I didn't know that AT&T had architects. You mean you, you actually sort of designed their buildings? <laughs> and, uh, so I do not know what architects are. Uh, I know what programmers are. Uh, part of the problem is that the title programmer became this disreputable thing. If you say I'm a programmer, it means that you're like really a bad person, like ignorant and you don't do anything useful. Okay? And it happened, it didn't happen just recently. Uh, when Paul and I were young, people were saying, no, I'm not a programmer, I'm an analyst. Paul remembers this term. Right? There was, you, you're supposed to be an analyst. And then there was this lowly people called programmers. Then... Yeah, I mean, weren't programming languages supposed to evolve so that you would just define the problem and that would be it? Yes, yes. People still believe that. I mean, this is this thing that, you know, that this programming is this menial task which, which anybody could do. And part... Part of the thing which I'm actually trying to say, no, programming is a wonderful activity, guys. Right? I, I'm very sad about that long time ago, in 1979, I got a job at General Electric, and my title was a computer scientist. And I started putting in my tax return, I started putting computer scientist. And since I didn't want to change my thing in all these IRS forms, I still do. But, you know, I wish I put a programmer then, and I wish I could put a programmer now without, I mean, by the way, Ken Thompson does put a programmer when he puts his, his occupation. You know, it's, it's wonderful to be a programmer. Okay? And, again, I think as programmers, we have to strive to be professionals. Why I'm talking about canon with this important book. Because we want to be at least as glamorous as <coughs> lawyers. Right? This is their prof Yes, uh, except. So we want to be at least as glamorous as lawyers. That is, we want to, to be professionals. We want to, to believe that what we do is a professional activity, right? Which means that we should have, like, they have Blackstone. It's like their Knuth. It's a great commentary on English common law. We have our Knuth. They claim that they have professional ethics. Whether they do or not, it's not to me to judge. I'm not a lawyer. But they claim they do. So should we. We should seriously think what are our ethical responsibilities as programmers. Right? For example, you know, how we should interact, I mean, what should we promise? Should we promise that we could deliver something we could never deliver? Probably it's not ethical. Probably we, as a field, we should start moderating our claims. One of the things I, I know that programmers do is they say, well, I could do it in, you know, 
in a day. Uh, maybe we should be more realistic. Maybe we should sort of, maybe what we produce should be quality product. Right? It is, maybe we cannot match lawyers, but maybe we could match ancient medieval guilds where there was some notion of professional guild sort of quality. I don't know whether you know, but you couldn't become a carpenter, a truly master carpenter, till you produced what? There is a technical term in English. A masterpiece. A masterpiece. What is a masterpiece? Is a piece which you produce, which other masters examine. That's a masterpiece. He's a master now. He's one of us. Right? And we say, well, do we really need all of this bureaucracy? Maybe not, but we should still strive to get to that le level. We should still try, strive to be masters. Right? Part of the reason, let, let me tell you, it's a sort of little confession. Why am I doing all of that? Why am I teaching this? Because I think that it is my professional responsibility. And in spite of many years of trying and failing to teach programming, this is not the first class I ever taught, I still hope that maybe I could find a way to, to, to help people to become masters in, in this old term. term to, right? And so we, we need to have pride of what we are, again, we should, I mean, it should be really only with great regret we should do what Ilya and Hernan do. Sort of say, abandoning this glorious profession and going and become taskmasters with whips. I, I mean, it's not glorious. I don't know. They should join, whatever, prison guard union? I have to say it because I'm proud of what I do. And every traitor to my trade <laughs> is a traitor to my trade. Right? Look, I mean, and I, I betrayed my trade for a few years, and I was very ashamed. But I repented. There is a chance for you guys. Still a chance. But again, so you think I'm joking, and I am, of course, joking. But I think that sort of getting to a point where we, we're actually proud of what we are, that we don't have to get to the next true level of being by becoming managers, product managers, project managers, program managers, whatever. I mean, all of that, sort of that being a programmer is good. And it used to be, it used to be that you know, the American engineers and programmers used to be engineers. As, as, a, as you know, Paul remembers, people would say, I'm an engineer. He still does. Uh, and uh, what, what, they were proud. They didn't, I mean, they didn't view it as a transitional thing, and then they will turn into butterfly after three years. Uh, it's, it's much worse, by the way, in India. You know, I used to go and teach these classes in India. And there, it's very clear that in three years, you have to become a manager. Otherwise, you, your mother couldn't find you a good wife. It's, I mean, it's literally, you know, by the age of 26, you're supposed to get married. 26, 27. And therefore, you have to be, become a manager. And everybody sort of, you either become a manager or you go to other company where you could become a manager. You cannot stay a programmer because it's demeaning. And what I want, again, some of you are young. Of course, I don't mean people like Paul and Daniel even. But, you know, people like Ryan. And uh, I want him to, to remain proud of what he does from now till he becomes as old as me and retires. So. It's a great thing to be a programmer. Right? Yes? So the ACM used to be 
back when attempting to be that professional. No programmer belongs to ACM. That's the sad and tragic thing. These professor types who cannot program kidnapped our organization. Right? I'm just stating the fact that the sad reality that we had a professional organization. ACM was a founded by programmers, for programmers. They were doing great things. They were publishing code. Could you imagine that? That was, again, only old people remember that. But there was a, an amazing thing. In early 60s, communications of ACM st started something called ACM collection of algorithms. And they would publish real code. It was supposed to be written in the programming language. There's only one official programming language in which people should be writing code. We'll be talking about it. By the way, what was it called? Which algo? 68. No. It was called algo 60. Nobody ever used algo 68 for anything except writing born shell. <laughs> born shell is written in C, but all its keywords are with define mapped into algo 68. You know. Steve Bourne came from algo 68. That's the only thing which remains. But algo 60, and we'll be talking about it a lot during this course. It's an important thing to know. Uh, was a language which was believed to be the language. All the programming would be done in it. All the algorithms will be defined in it. It didn't work, and we'll see why. But they started publishing code. Some of the greatest code which we're going to encounter in this class was published in this collect. I mean, it still exists. You could still buy it. ACM collection of algorithms. But eventually what happened was that programmers abandoned even that. The sort of the ACM collection of algorithms became a property of numerical analysts. Communication of ACM, which used to be a great, great technical journal for programmers. I remember when I was young, I was literally waiting every month for it to come because there would be these great articles, papers by these guys. Discussing pressing things, things about programming. Sometimes writing, you know, we will encounter one of the famous letters written by Dijkstra, which sort of became his most famous work. Do you know what was the letter called? Go to Considered Harmful. Very good. Which was, by the way, not the title he intended. But we will be talking about Go to and Go to Considered Harmful. In any case, that was a great thing. Everybody belonged to ACM. Everybody subscribed to ACM. Uh, it's no longer so. And I cannot blame, blame you guys for, I suspect most of you do not belong. Am I right? How many do? OK, my very point. So ACM abandoned us. And we have nothing to, to replace it with. Okay? People say, oh, but you could join Boost. Oh, guys, be serious. I mean, uh, so uh, you know, it's, it's difficult. But this is something which, I, again, I, the message to you, to younger people, too late for me, you have to eventually create such an organization for programming which would publish something which you would want to read. Otherwise, you will not be a professional. I mean, lawyers have their journals. Doctors have their journals. Programmers have to have their journals. Again, this is an this is important thing. Professional ethics, professional organization. This is important. We need to be structured. Again, we became, again, this is a very dangerous thing. We became artists by Art is the idea is that we don't have to get haircuts, we don't need to shave, look at Jack there. Uh, you know, and you know, we could just do whatever we please. We could write code with our foot, left foot. Uh, and you know, it's all fine. 
again, we need to strive to become much more boring professional organization. But it's good for you. It's good for me. It's good for the field. Right? So, but then we have to go to important question. But I was trying to bring it, and he, he sort of asked and asked, but we, we pay no attention. What's the question? What is the discipline? What do we mean when we say programming? Right? What do I mean? Let us, let us, what do we mean by saying we are programmers? Anybody want to try? What, what unites us? I don't mean union, that's not allowed around here, but what unites us as a, as a profession? What, what do we share in common? What, we know what unites doctors. They strive to provide what? Health. I mean, you say, well, they're actually about making money. Maybe, but they deny it. They claim that their goal is to make people healthy. Lawyers, and again, so they, they're surely just into money, but their goal is what? Justice. That's the goal of the activist, too. What is our goal? Write as many lines of code as possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad start, by the way. That is, it's clearly part of our discipline is to write code. And I would like to, 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 to just slightly modify what, slightly modify it. I mean, we want to write lines of code which run digital computers. This is the, the term when I was young, people didn't talk about programming just as programming, they said programming digital computers. It was a very important thing that there is this machine which we program. This is too broad. Think about it, because mathematicians would claim they provide rationality as well. And of course, we are a mathematical discipline. We, we sort of, yes? If you want to like, control, like, make computers have, uh, serve mankind? And... No, I don't want mankind there. <laughs> no. Uh, no justice in American way either. I think we reduce <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we do, but in a very, well, actually not looking at your code. I don't mean you personally. I mean that. <laughs> yeah, but, but again, I think that Hernan started the correct thing. We actually program computers to, to do what? Well, we write the right lines of code to solve problems. To solve problems, let us go a little bit further. Sort of, what kind of problems? We're trying to represent reality and different planes of reality, whether physical world, whether political world, economic world, different planes of reality. We want to represent them in the Digital computer, that's what we do. We want to take Amazon products, whatever we are selling, and somehow represent them in the computer and allow people sort of access to that reality. Right? Sort of modeling the reality is the central part of programming. Okay? This is what, what I want to, to sort of emphasize that every programmer fundamentally does this amazing task. Sort of, you take the reality, something, a banking system, you know, e-commerce site, satellite navigation system, some reality. Then, sort of, I'm going to say something which should happen, which seldom does. Then, 
we conceptually come up with its mathematical model. We have to somehow map it from reality, whatever, Jeff's warehouses and whatever it contains, into some mathematical model. Say, there is no mathematics in Jeff. Yes, there is. You have to come up with a notion of AC and figure out what it is. I mean, you know, you map things into, if you like, numbers, mathematical reality. And then there is this amazing step which we do, which is ours. We map this mathematical model into, but before code, there is this wonderful thing, wonderful thing, which nobody dares to say anymore. Yes, we map that into bits. And I want to, sort of one of the central points of programming, which, which sort of nobody wants to say anymore, because bits are sort of their evil things. No, this is the great discovery on which everything we do is based, is that for any mathematical concept, numbers, whatever, geometrical objects, there is a representation of that as a sequence of zeros and ones, which was a very great discovery, which led to what all we have. But sadly enough, then people come and say, let us hide bits. There is nothing shameful about bits. By the way, who invented bits? Anybody know? Leibniz. Leibniz, very good. So they were not invented by some, you know, practical person building, you know, banking system. This is the greatest mathematician of at least one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, Leibniz, the guy who invented calculus, or co-invented, whichever way you like, you know, the teacher of people like uh, Bernoulli and Euler. I mean, the, if you look, all the mathematics sort of goes back to, to Leibniz. He stands at the beginning of what we do. He realized that you could have binary numbers why did he want binary numbers, by the way? What was, what was he thinking about? Not quite. Yes, but in, in a very specific way. Leibniz is part of this ancient tradition, which actually goes back to at least 14th century to a person called Raymond Lull, or Raymond Lully, a great Catalan philosopher and mathematician. Uh, the idea of creating a mechanical device for doing reasoning. Huh? Mechanical device for doing reasoning. And Leibniz, who was, you know, this is the device which was sort of Lully first postulated, then Leibniz thought about it, Pascal thought about it, Leibniz thought about it, then, of course, Babbage, and all, all of that. But th there is, we have a pedigree. We, we didn't come out of, you know, mud. We have some reputable ancestors. So Leibniz came up with the idea that you could encode everything, especially numbers, as this sequence of zeros and ones. Right? So it was a mathematical discovery. And then another great mathematician in the 20th century realized that it should be at the center of formal, formal computation. Who was that? Keep, keep fishing, you will find. The next name you have is Turing. Yes, of course, Alan Turing. Right? He suddenly realized that you could encode everything on this tape with just zeros and ones. A remarkable discovery. Right? So I actually claim that, you know, sort of this is not something anybody would dare to say, but I say it. Proudly, the, our task is to take the real world problem, reduce them to mathematics, and then reduce them to the sequences of zeros and ones. Right? And then, of course, we write some, Ilya is right, some code which manipulates the sequences of zeros and ones. But first, you have to map reality into zeros and ones. That's what we do. Sort of this, we, I'm going to, to sort of repeat at time 
And again, that's the center of, of programming. Right? So that we have to take a problem and represent it as some, this is no longer done, sadly enough. Uh, when, long time ago, we started programming old people, almost dead people, the first thing you had to do was to come up with your data layout. For example, you were designing a compiler. You had to come up with exact sort of bit representation of all the objects. Symbol table and the car. I mean, right? that was the beginning. Sadly enough, people no longer do that. Bits are hidden. Nobody ever wants to design things as one big monolithic whole. What you need to do, you need to start producing lots of little objects. Sort of the thing we will be discussing, sort of one of the novel things is that instead of finding zeros and ones, you need to think in terms of some object frameworks, finding patterns, having factories. You guys discovered factories. And what you do not have are uh, old-fashioned data structure. And part of the, this course is the, the attempt to bring back these things which called data structure. Uh, but I mean, why is that fundamentally different? Because the objects are implemented in terms of bits, and you're just thinking in as, as a, uh, if, with a higher level abstraction. Are they implemented in terms of bits in mind of any programmer you know? Would they even know? Would they even know what I, I mean, you're, okay. Let me argue back. You're the guy who brought Python into A9. Am I right? <laughs> Does any Python programmer knows about bits? Could he or she? No. No. That is. There is, and people know that programming in Python is better <laughs> because it hides the machine. Um, better for some things, but because it hides the machine, I, I don't follow that, that logic there. It might not be your logic, but it's a very, have you heard it, guys, that sort of this machine needs to be hidden? There are like people, proponents here, like look at Ilya. He thinks that JVM, I mean, when, before he was promoted, of course, uh, he, was, he was doing this thing. He was going around saying, oh, C++, it's all kaput. We have this modern language called Java. I heard him saying that. And Java runs on virtual machine, JVM. They are very proud is that you cannot see bits. They, they're really proud. They think it's a great advantage, right? And you say, Alex, but not, yes? So, but the reason for that is for portability. You say bits are not portable? Well, <laughs> not if each machine, each type of machine represents. Oh, they have different bits. They, they represent them differently. Not bits. That's why I know bit is a bit is a bit. Okay. You know, since Leibniz till today, there was one exception. In Russia, <laughs> in Russia, in 19, late 1950s, they decided that instead of flip flop, they introduced flip flap flop, ternary computer called Saturn with ternary bits. They could have values zero, minus one, and one. Have you ever heard of this computer? Exactly. Yes. Oh, you heard. Okay. So did Knuth. So and then they were not bits, they were trits. They were trits. You are correct. They were trits. So yes, they were. But bits are bits are bits. We'll, we'll get to that. But I understand what, what, what Java, I'm not denying the sort of the, they had some valid goals. But they joined this crowd which says, bits are bad, let us hide them. And you could say that only unwashed masses believe that, not the great people behind Java. False. Once upon a time, maybe 10 years ago, I was invited to participate in a, uh, uh, 
uh, when we put people like that and ask them panel discussion with, uh, you would love it, uh, Guido Van Rossum, Larry Wall, Guy Steele, and me. And of course, the conversation was like, if you want to do things, use Python. Then, if you want to do things, use uh, uh, Perl. If you want to do things, use either Scheme or Java, depending. <laughs> and I was saying, use bits. And I was not, you know, everybody expected me to say, oh, you have to use C++ STL generic programming. I was saying, use bits. And actually, it's not what I said. I said, you know, the C provides a wonderful abstraction of, of its abstract machine, and people need to know. And guy still turns to me, you mean sequence of bytes with total disgust? And I said, yes, I mean sequence of bytes. We will be talking about bytes is not as natural and intuitive as bit. Byte is a compromise. But it was great compromise, which eventually evolved. We need to understand it. <laughs> but again, sort of, I'm coming as this guy who says bits are good, bytes are good, machine is good. You have to know the machine. This is why I want to say we program digital computers, not JVMs, not scheme virtual machine. We program, eventually, we program these things, chips. And I claim that these chips, these things which come from Intel, are far deeper in terms of what, what needs to be done than JVM or Scheme Machine or anything else. Why do I say that? I claim that the modern CPU needs to be started because of what? On one hand, it's because that's what we use eventually. You know, there's this machine sits there. But I claim there is a deeper reason. You see, it's not that CPU designers are that brilliant. They make very many mistakes. Even people who are, I mean, when I was young, it was commonly believed that the greatest CPU designer was a person called Bob Barton. Anybody heard of Bob Barton? Who heard of Bob Barton? OK. You see what I mean. What computer did he design? Of course, you never heard. He designed a great computer, which was the best computer of all time, at least according to Dijkstra, called Boros 5500. Have you heard of Boros? Have you heard of 5500? What was the central idea? The central idea, I mean, there were several, but the central idea which I want to, to sort of emphasize that Bob Barton said, this is really stupid that we have plus for integers and plus for floats and plus for shorts. We have one plus instruction. And we'll do the right thing, depending. I mean, later on, people say Bob Barton invented object oriented, whatever. Uh, yeah, he's like Al Gore. You know. uh, <laughs> Al Gore is the guy who invented the internet. So, uh, and every word in memory would have a tag, which will say, oh, I'm an integer. Oh, I'm a real. And they said, this is the way to go. This is this tagged architecture. That was the greatest thing. Do you think it's madness? No, that's how people believed. And even people in reputable schools, there's this school next to Boston across the river, they all were running around. You went there. Uh, they all running around, say, tagged architectures. They built this thing called Lisp machine, which of course wouldn't show bits and would have tags. Right? And people were saying, well, you know, you don't need too many bits for a tag because how many data types do you have? Two? Three? Well, they were wrong. The thing didn't work. So what I'm, you know, nobody has tags anymore. 
or at least not hardware attacks. Now, why I'm talking about Bob Barton? What I'm trying to say that the smartest people, and he was very smart, by the way, could make mistakes. And some other smart people, brilliant people, geniuses, such as Dijkstra, could evaluate them as the greatest people, and it doesn't matter. Why do we know that he's wrong? He hasn't survived. Right? I'm going to say this horrible thing, which if anybody knows me, knows that it's a very unnatural thing for me to say. Marketplace. <laughs> right? no, no, I'm not a believer in capitalism as a good system. Uh, sorry. I don't have it's free country and you don't I mean you think you must, but you really don't have to. Uh, but the marketplace serves this amazingly good task. I'm not against marketplace as a mechanism. Right? It's a good mechanism at eventually bad architectures die out. This is why we have to study Intel. Because Intel is a result of a long evolution. You know, many customers wanted things, and Intel would try this. I'm not claiming any, you know, that Paul Atalini is a genius. I don't think he was, or he is, or whatever. He resigned now, right? He's not Atalini, whatever. But I'm not claiming that any of Intel guys actually knew what they were doing. There are many brilliant people. But the thing is that they were reacting to customers' demands. And the chip was evolving. And things were appearing on you know, different things. And talk about the result is perfect. Like the critical flaws will die out. Eventually. Eventually. It might take decades. But this is why you know, I claim that we should take the computer seriously, not some idiotic virtual computer invented by some genius. But the real computer, because this computer evolved. This computer first had this, and you know, Intel is this best example of something which was utterly unusable when it started. Those of you who remember early Intel chips, I mean, it appeared to be utterly impossible for it to survive. OK, I, it so happened that I was part of the people who in the late 90s were discussing where sort of architectures would go. I, and I was fairly high up. And there was a uni unanimous consensus everywhere, including Intel, that Intel architecture will be dead within five years. There's absolutely no chance it is going to survive. This is why Intel invested multiple billion of dollars into Itanium. How many of you use Itanium? Not just that. They did not invest any money in the follow-on to the x86, which was done by AMD, not by Intel. Yes. x 64 was AMD. Everybody, everybody believed that 8086 was dead. Right? When I attempted to convince my boss at the time, uh, Forrest Basket, the CTO of SGI, that SGI had to invest in 80, you know, 8086 based system, whatever the uh, system. He said, Alex, smarter people than you thought about it, meaning just go away. Itanium was the way and the, the path, all the money should be invested into Itanium. Uh, there is no Itanium. It's a, I mean, it still exists someplace, but it's effectively dead. And it's not, again, the guy who designed Itanium, Bill Worley, I'm proud to say he's a friend of mine, good friend of mine. And he did a wonderful job. Didn't work. Right? Because he designed, again, a perfect system for running perfect CPU, for running Linpack. If you don't run Linpack, maybe you don't, I mean, sort of, it was a cray on a desk that was the the plan. Nobody wants cray on the desk. So again, the modern Intel is a marvelous thing. We will see many things which they changed. It is a very powerful tool. And that's what we program again. Sort of the 
the thing which we need to, to, to realize that programming involves, mul it's a multi-layer discipline. We're not like people in computer science who could say, oh, I do computer architecture. So I'll study computer architecture, but I know nothing about computer languages, compilers, uh, algorithms. Or well, I do algorithms, but I cannot program these algorithms. Most, most algorithms people never program these algorithms. One, one of the sort of top algorithms people, Bob Tarjan, when I talk to him about it, he says, Alex, it is very hard. And it is indeed. Right? Writing papers are it's easy, relatively speaking. So what, what happens is that for us, and this is, this is again the glory of what we do, we have to understand the domain. We have to understand the problem itself. We need to come up with mathematical mapping. We need to know, you know some mathematics which represents that. For example, if you want to do IR, IR you have to know sort of vector space model of uh, information retrieval, sort of you need to know how to uh, compute the distance between two documents. There is some nice mathematical stuff. Then you need to understand data structures to map that onto data structure, maybe bits. Then you have to implement it on a real computer. We need to know the whole stack. A programmer sort of has a duty to, to understand. It's not that a programmer needs to be a computer architecture person, but you, you need to know what computers do. It's not that you need to be a compiler person, but you need to know what a compiler does. I hear time and time again, you know, even here I remember working with my friends here, especially if you remember Dan, my, my former boss and friend, Dan Rose, you would always say, but Compiler should optimize that. And compiler will never optimize. He would be always amazed that I'll do some simple code transformation which will affect timing greatly. He said, oh, I thought compilers are smarter. No compiler. You need to know where compilers are. By the way, they're pretty stupid. They, I mean, they're not intelligent at all. They're just compilers. So there are certain things they do, and they do them exceptionally well. Certain things they don't do at all, and you have to know what they do. No programmer needs to know how to write a compiler. Well, except those programmers who write compilers. But every programmer needs to know how to use a compiler. Right? So this, the fact that we need to know this stack is the wonderful thing. And again, what we will attempt to do, it's not going to be easy is to, in this course, to show you the, the interaction between, between these different, different layers, which is, OK? So what I don't think I could, I was planning to do it, but uh, let me just give you a short preview of where I will start the next lecture. I'm going to make a grandiose claim at the beginning of the next lecture. I'm going to make a claim that programming languages do not matter, right? Sort of, because one of the things which all of you know is that you know programming is about choosing C++ versus Java, or Scala, or Erlang, or Haskell, or whatever. And if you choose the right tool, everything will be solved. And the dream of every young programmer is to design his own ultimate programming language. Because if he does that, I mean, like if he designs a language, say, called Go, you know, that will just make him immortal. So the, the claim with which I will, we will start, and we will try to sort of explain it practically by showing, showing code, is that first, Programming languages do not matter. Of course, the, then, after I convince you of that successfully, we'll get to the next point, is that you actually have to know the programming language you're using. Sort of, they're somewhat contradictory claims, but uh, 
they tend to be, uh, in, in reality, when I deal with young people, they tend to be like, the programming languages do matter. But of course, I'm not going to learn one. Sort of people make these wild statements as Java is better than C++. C++ is better than Java. But then when you start talking, apparently, some great experts which they know, know Java, they themselves are just, you know, naive people. Or some, same thing for C++. Again, what I claim that first, you don't have to believe me now. I'm just giving you a quick preview of what we'll be discussing next time, is that programming languages do not matter. And what we will try to do, again, we will try to start writing some code in different programming languages and running it and measuring it. And then we will, hopefully it will lead someplace. We actually, we think we know where it will all lead, but we're not going to tell you the full path. And I will try to get it more interactive. It's not, it's not very interactive now, but we, we, we will see how, how it works. All right, guys. See you next week.